Hello, this is Jim for the Monopoly Project. We're doing one of our floating book reviews again here on Val Vista Lakes. This, uh, it's on February. And unfortunately, it's a bikini girl's day off, so you only have me on the, Val Vista, on the uh, Monopoly Project yacht. Uh, today, we're here to review three books. Um, all of them concern the history of Phoenix. Um, one of them is a fictional book. Two others are non-fiction books. And they're all concerned about the gold spot. We bought the gold spot building in downtown Phoenix uh, last year, and we're researching history of it because it was built in 1925, and it's coming up on the 100th year anniversary, and so we're going to put up a website and make a big deal out of it. And so uh, we're going to get to these three books. You can see it's a little cloudy and overcast on Phoenix, and it's cooling down a little, um, but uh, we're here on the yacht, and so we're going to get started. We'll get back to you with our book here in a minute okay this is Jim back for our uh, second book in our book review as I said earlier we're uh, reviewing books for the Monopoly Project on the Monopoly Project yacht every every successful real estate investor has a yacht and this is the Monopoly Project yacht and unfortunately it's the bikini girls day off so you just have me but today we're in the second of our three books on the history of Phoenix and this one is called a brief history of Phoenix uh, by John Talton and we just reviewed uh, John Talton's uh, fiction book about Phoenix in our previous review. So if you want to hear that, you know, look up, up above this one in the reviews and you'll see that. Um, but the, A Brief History of Phoenix is, uh, it's only 144 pages, paperback. It was written in uh, 2015. Um, so the Amazon description is, is in 1950. Phoenix ranked 99th among the largest cities in the United States. Today it ranks 6th, a growth driven by a remarkable quartet of men who promoted sprawl instead of personal spoils. This book, by, written by a fourth generation Arizonan, is the first to outline the shady side as well as the sunshine promotions that fueled this growth. It's a brief account, but T Talton balances lyrical detail and sordid scandal. And you can see this, they're talking about 2015 and Phoenix rest recently passed, I think, Philadelphia and is now the fifth largest city in the United States. Um, and of course is pushing Houston for fourth largest. Um, so we'll see what happens in the near future, especially after COVID, it's continued to boom. Um, so anyway, so this, John writes a, a brief history of, of um, how we got to the fifth largest city in only like a hundred years. It was actually settled, first uh, uh, settled or seen in 1830, so it's, it, it might be more like 200 years, but when it really got going. Um, I really liked the book. It, I didn't know a lot of the stuff, especially the early stuff in Phoenix. You know, you get this, this idea that, you know, the city's you know been here forever and you know there's not any real history and he tells some real interesting stories uh, one of the things I like in the intro that he does is he introduces a lot of ideas that I've thought of myself privately that you know I didn't write him down but he wrote them down and a couple three examples is um, is Mesa is a um, suburb of Phoenix and it's just north of Gilbert where I am now in fact it's if you go across the baseline road right over here, you'll be in Mesa. But anyway, Mesa is bigger than a lot of really well-known cities in the United States. It's Cincinnati, St. Louis, um, it, it's in terms of population. So it just shows how big the Phoenix area has grown. He also talks about haboobs, which are these big desert dust storms that we have, literally a mile high and five miles wide, dust coming at you. Uh, we've gone through a number of them, the dust gets into everything, but they got really popular by, by calling them Haboob for obvious reasons. Um, and then on page 11, he, uh, he qu quoting his, him, he says, Phoenix is one of the great accomplishments of American civilization. Uh, I'd never thought about that, but I really appreciate him saying that because I'm tired of modern writers and authors who put must put everything down to show that they're in the know and they're hip and they're cool and they're jaded nothing impresses them he he has a for example in the first chapters on jack's willing on the founder it's a great chapter uh, he gives a bio of, 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 of swilling you know warts and all and, and on page 17 he defends him 
saying, quote, but Swilling deserves better, and especially his last paragraph on the page. I will read it to you, but you can see uh, I'm about to run into some other boats because I'm not, I'm not exercising good boatsmanship. Um, but let me read it to you as soon as I don't hit this boat in front of me. Um, you can see the wind's picking up a little, the clouds are picking up, and it's getting cold. Um, okay, so in his last paragraph where he defends, he says, he says, indeed, Swilling is an appropriate first Phoenician. Critically, he understood the potential of the Salt River Valley and acted on it. He was visionary, audacious, and enterprising. He crossed the continent to practice unceasing self-reinvention in this new place, this blank slate. He came from a culture of white supremacy but created a multicultural family. Swilling's joint stock canal company provided the prototype for other water projects. He made money and lost it, boomed and busted, manifest destiny and the sensibility of the South were with him. And well through the first half of the 20th century, Phoenix would be a Southern as well as a Western city. And like that city, his devils would always be at war with his angels. Uh, I really appreciate that defense of Swilling. And I guess Swilling ends up being accused, I don't know, rightfully or wrongfully, of holding up a stage coach. He's put in jail in Yuma and he dies there. And that's basically the, the genesis of this last paragraph of him defending Swilling. And so um, the other good thing about, about Talton is, it, again, unlike a lot of moderns, um, he can put put aside his modern glasses and see the world as it as it was as the founders did and in an example on page 20 he says quote farming meant something very different in the 19th century than it does today and he's putting it in context that phoenix was started as a farming community and you know now of course most people don't even care about that they don't even know about that but talton has the historical background and knowledge and appreciation of you know what it was like then uh, and p on page 32 again he he quotes the old western adage uh, waters whiskeys for drinking and waters for fighting over uh, he goes into the uh, details on uh, all the canals that were built and the water that was brought here and everything um, and then on page 33 he talks about roosevelt dam which was the highest masonry dam built uh, uh, Roosevelt, of course, President Ro Roosevelt authorized it. But he makes a, an interesting uh, quote on that page. Uh, reclamation in Phoenix, reclamation, he's talking about water reclamation, you know, and primary, the centerpiece of that is the Roosevelt Dam. Reclamation in Phoenix was the most widespread experiment of social engineering in American history. Uh, it's an interesting thought. I, I don't I don't know if I agree with that, but I has some plausibility. I mean, offhand, I can think of you know, uh, the Lyndon Johnson's Great Society as being um, a widespread experiment. Um, obviously, the wars the United States were involved in, but that that's expected of a nation, right? Wars are not. It's not social experimentation. It's in theory forced on you by the enemy. So anyway, so it, it, he, he raises some interesting issues and again, he doesn't look at it from a jaded modern view. And so um, I got to respond to Michelle because she's sending me a message. Um, so anyway, uh, let, me, let me finish up here real quick. Um, on page 11, he talks about the, uh, he talks about the development of, of you know, how how we developed the Phoenix area by leapfrogging areas and that's what happened to the gold spot is it got leapfrogged over and it went into a disrepair it was almost tore down it was vacant for 20 or 30 years uh, and renovated in 20 2002 only and so he talks about this and on page 11 he talks about a, a, a development on the border between Phoenix and um, Scottsdale. Scottsdale is the fancy suburb of Phoenix. It's the you know high rollers, uh, fancy people, um, and the, the development is called Kirlin Commons. And so he says, "quote Mixed use Kirlin Commons, which had a Phoenix address and sent taxes to the city, while claiming Scottsdale's growing cachet." Um, end quote. 
Uh, the reason why I, I highlight that is because in 2019, we almost sold our apartments and one of the investments we were looking to move into was, um, uh, what's it called, Kierlin Business Center. And it's exactly as he said, although I, I think he gets it a little wrong. What it had was a, um, here now I got John, I will answer them in a minute. Um, he has a, uh, it has a Scottsdale address but it pays Phoenix taxes, which are less than Scottsdale. It also uses Phoenix water and Phoenix um, trash, which again is, is less than Scottsdale. So that was the appeal of it. You had a fancy address, but you weren't paying the fancy uh, uh, utility and tax prices. Um, it turns out we didn't buy the, the uh, unit. And you can see here, uh, I'll, I'll put a better color picture up. This is from the brochure. Um, uh, I'll put a better color picture up, but we did not buy it because the sale did not go through. We decided to keep the property, and of course, it's since tripled, so that was <laughs> very fortunate on our part. Um, it turns out that two years later, that building and another one next to it were sold together to redevelop into apartments, and I think they did it. I, I haven't looked up whether they actually executed that, especially with COVID and all that going on. Um, so it, it, there's a lot of interesting comments in there that you know we have some some experience with and my final point on the book is uh, on a specific point is on page 112 Palos Verdes is a nuclear generating power plant that's like 40 or 40 miles west of Phoenix on I-10 and he says Palos Verdes three reactors are cooled by effluent water from the valley cities I did not know that that's an interesting uh, fact so anyway, like I said, this is, it's, it's definitely a brief history, but it's very good. Uh, there's lots of detail, you know, specific uh, little nuggets like those that I just mentioned. And so I definitely would also recommend this book by John Talton. Well, that's that one. And we got one more book, nonfiction on the history of Phoenix. And so I will call Michelle and Jonathan back. And then I will come back and do our last book review. Thank you.